Hello, my name is Jupiter Hadley, and today we're doing another What's Indie News podcast, this time for September. Um, and as always, I'm here with Kem Hello. and Joseph. Hey! <laughs> was, that a, was that a bit too strong? Oh, right. No, no, perfect. that was perfect. That was everything I expected <laughs> and more. Awesome. Cool, so we're just going to get right into the news, because that's the way this podcast works. All right, so... Major news uh, on the 6th of September, the gamesindustry.biz spoke about um, an Animal Farm game now in development. So if people don't know, Animal Farm is a book by George Orwell. Um, if if you're a British viewer and did GCSE English, you might recognize Animal Farm. Same if you went to high school in America. It's a required reading book. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah, we never read that. I, well, I did, actually. I think it's a mix between Animal Farm and uh, 1984 sometimes. Sorry, Kemp, what did you say? Oh, so we never read that at school. Weird. Did you read 1984? No. Oh. It, it was entirely Hamlet and Lord of the Flies. Ah. I've read Lord of the Fri- Flies and Hamlet for school as well. Ah, oh, that's interesting. I, well, personally, I did Animal Farm. Um, and it's... Got a star-studded cast of a team. So you have game designer Imre uh, Yeller, uh, who is co-founder and creator of Bosa Studios. Uh, you have industry head Andy Payne, who is the founder of GamesAid. Cinematic and performance director Kate Saxon, who is the director for Fable 3. Former Lion head creator George Baker and BAFTA-winning game composer Jessica Curry. And Yeller said, Animal Farm will be a narrative-led management game. This adventure tycoon will place the player in the manor farm as one of the animals just before the revolution and will follow their journey through the ups and downs of the farm. Sounds like a very interesting game. I am excited, personally. Interested to see how they'll adapt it. Mm. A management game. Yeah, I think there are some interesting design choices you can make to kind of steer players to almost follow the decisions that the book that the animals make in the book. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I wonder how much control that the player will have over the actual story. How much, like, input? I'm excited. It's a very good lineup of different um, people working on it. They're all really big names and, like, really great at each of their, like, respective roles. Yeah, that is quite the lineup, yeah. I know, I was surprised that Imra didn't really do it through just Bosa Studios, but I think it just seems like a passion project for a group of them. Good. All right, cool. Moving on. All right. So... On the 12th of September 2017, um, Mike Bithell's subsurface circular sees just 2% refund rate. Um, so as reported by gamesindustry.biz again, it seems that the game um, is already well on its way to profitability just a few weeks in. We've made back production costs in three weeks, have a stable 97% Steam review score, and are going to continue to explore short games, Bithell said. Short yet deep experiences don't hurt the wallet or purse much. Could be a market to explore for more indies. The game sells for just under $6 on Steam, and in addition to the very positive user reviews, it enjoys numerous accolades from critics. I actually played Subsurface Circular. How was it? I, it was, I really enjoyed it. I managed to finish it within two hours. So potentially it could be under the refund policy if I so decided but i actually really enjoyed it as a game hmm. and wanted to keep it and even actually spent time they put in developer commentary on top of it yeah which is also really cool and i think it's a really good for replayability and longevity i was just gonna say i heard the developer commentary was actually quite good very well implemented yeah the way it was it was interesting so basically in the game you'll sit down on the train talking to people and you can't move and so what they did they added an extra robot that you can talk to who's basically mike bithell as a robot who talks about the game and you just ask him different questions at different points in the game, saying, oh, how did you get make this, and what made you just choose this or decide this? And then it responds to you and tells you what happened and why, and the development process behind it. Hmm. That's a really nice way to implement um, sort of developer notes in a game. However, I kind of disagree with uh, um, short yet deep experiences. Uh, could be a market to for more indies to explore. A lot of people complain that indie games are too short, and I feel like one of the major reasons why Subsurface Circular did so well and is doing so well is because Mike Bithell's Mike Bithell. <laughs> He's built a community around himself to the point where his games won't fail. Unless they're really awful, they're not going to fail. Um, so I feel like saying other indies could do this is kind of 
a bit presumptuous. Um, if you make shorter, shorter experiences, you'll have more of a refund rate because you're not Mike Bithel. You're not selling it to your audience who you've cultivated who like your stuff. Um, so it's just a weird statement to me. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> sorry, coughing there. Um, I, I mean, what I usually hear about the refund rates is usually that they're pretty low, even for really short games. I don't know. I've heard that refund rates can be quite high. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'm I am kind of the audience for these games because I don't have a huge amount of free time. So something that I know is going to take, say, half an hour to an hour, or that I can spit into a few segments of that length, much easier for me to play than something where I sit there and think, well, I'm going to have to put three hours into this segment, and then there's a whole rest of the game after that. And yeah, sh- short short things are good for me. I don't think many people are going to even buy a short game, though, to be honest, because, um, I don't know, no offense, Kemp, younger people are not really, like, the target audience people with lots of free time for most games. Uh, I feel like they tend to have more just sort of money to spend because they don't have responsibilities, and I feel like they don't tend to buy short games. I don't know, I might be completely wrong, it might just be how I feel, but I feel like I hear a lot of, like, people bash uh, shorter indie games. So it's just weird to hear someone else go, well, because Mike Bithel's short indie game worked, everyone should make short indie games. I oh, know, that, that's a, it's a fair point, really. Um, it, it does seem to be the trend that as you get older, get more responsibilities, you that's when you stop playing the longer games. But yeah, younger people, obviously, are, are a huge audience, so... It's just interesting to me. I'm glad that Mike Bithell's game's doing so well, and I'm glad that he's doing so well. But just even, like, the marketing strategy around this, if I'm not going to say anything and I'm going to tweet, that wouldn't work for other people. It wouldn't work for an indie studio you hadn't heard of. So I find it weird that so many people are like, oh, you can do this, you can be like him, you don't have to do all of these other things when it works because of the audience he cultivated. No one's really um, commented on the fact that he's made a following, he's made an audience, and then he gave the audience a game, and then they bought it, like, because of the the thing that he's created, as opposed to it being short, and as opposed to it being not advertised as that's the reason why, or whatever. I don't know. Oh, de- definitely. I mean, you need a, a community there, even for a good game with marketing, you still need the community to sell anything, really. Yeah, you do. Um, and, yeah, you need a huge audience just to be able to pull the trick of, oh, here's a game. Yeah, and for it to sell. It reminds me very much of when Bo Burnham um, was asked to give advice, and he said, "Don't take advice from people like me. Don't take advice from people like Kim Kardashian who tell you to follow your dreams, because they're like the vast few." Yeah. <laughs> and they're not. They're not. It's not just because they did it doesn't mean it's going to work for everyone. Mm. And that's how I feel. And a lot of people are using Mike Bithell's game as like a way that you can learn from him. And I don't feel like it's quite correct. I don't feel like the comparisons match up with other indie studios. So I'd be weary of, you know, making short experiences when that's not what you're doing. And that, I don't know, I'd cultivate an audience before you release any game, really. I'm going on a tangent. We should move on. Oh, yeah, fair enough, too. <laughs> Next one, super exciting for me. Because I'm I'm a big big AI nerd, but he's an AI guy. <laughs> an AI guy. 20th of September, Unity's machine learning turn its engine into an AI toolkit. Um, so the Unity engine now has been updated with a beta version of an AI toolkit. Uh, this toolkit beta, uh, beta or beta available later this year is for Unity machine learning agents. It is hoped that AI engines will be able to be trained in complex scenarios and utilize machine learning within the Unity engine itself. So, it's setting up an environment for which you can do machine learning stuff super easily within Unity, which... How does that make you feel? Ah, I'm excited. I'm, I can make games, and then I can make AI to make to play the games. So then I don't need anyone to play them except my AI. I can make games that no one plays except the AI. So we thought robots were going to take over our jobs. It turns out they're taking over our hobbies. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I think that'll be interesting. Um, but it's good because um, this democratization of machine learning is, seems to be becoming very popular in that, as well, App, Apple, probably not important to that many people here, but Apple also who have announced that they're releasing their library for their machine learning environment as well. And so it's great that Unity's doing it. And I think um, it's going to be a very accessible environment for people to learn about machine learning because i think it has some interesting potential in games i have no idea what potential but i'm interested to see what people might do with it now that they have the tools available to them to creatively explore these ideas that they have and that's the thing like ai is such a 
it's like procedural generation in my head. It's such a um, what is it called when you're like afraid of something or if it seems like too big? Gargantuan. I don't know. It feels like a very complex thing when you hear about AI. You're like, oh, you can make these things that do stuff. It, it just sounds um, intimidating. That's what I'm looking for. It just sounds very intimidating. And then I see people doing cool stuff with AI, and I'm sure you know because you're really into AI. But, like, Mike Cook has Angelina, which is creating games and then also throwing away game ideas and being, like, really realistic in developing games. And then there's also some people down in Falmouth, uh, Meta Makers, and they have an AI that really quickly designs a level, mm -hmm. designs several variations of that level, of that, like, core gameplay, and then picks... Um, a mid-ranking level that's not impossible from all of those like um, procedurally generated designs and then we'll play through that and then give it to you and then if you play through it it'll like decide based on what you do what to make as the next iteration of the game and that just like blows my mind and it's so amazing um, but there's only a few things that I've ever heard of that are using AI in a way like that so it's um it's going to be super interesting giving them accessible tools giving people exp accessible tools so that they can um, figure out what they want to do and just add more yep. to the stuff that's created. And just see what will come up with in things like Proc Jam, because you'll be able to use this machine learning stuff within uh, procedural generation mm -hmm. and potentially other kind of, even especially game jams, would be really interesting to see people take advantage more of machine learning, especially machine learning for, because where I see machine learning being really good is procedural generation yeah. rather than in actual AI agents. So personally, I'm all for more people doing more things with AI, and um, that's why I really wanted to talk about this. Everyone, go do more stuff with AI, specifically for the Proc Jam. Yeah, do it for the Proc Jam. Uh, I love Proc Jams, so that's why I'm going to do it for Proc Jam, but do it anyway. But also do it for Proc Jam. Proc Jam's great. Proc Jam never ends, actually. It doesn't end until you want it to end, so, you know, do it whenever and submit it to Proc Jam. Oh, wow, Proc Jam never ends. How meta. No, well, it's got, like, an end time, but it doesn't actually end. They take late submissions to, like, months later. Oh, okay. All right. Two days later, on the 22nd of September, um, former Firewatch developer starts a new studio, Caledonia. Uh, Nails Anderson, who was a designer for Firewatch, uh, Camp which was developed by Camposanto, opened his own studio, announcing on Twitter, saying, Okay, things are real enough to say I've started a cool team of people to make a sweet video game. We're Caledonia. We will be talking about the team and game soonish, but mostly this is just because I know there are all kinds of things I don't know. Hmm. Which I think is a great sentence for game development. I like how they named their studio off of what sounds like a mystical fairy tale island. Caledonia. Where where do you rule, sir? I hail from Caledonia. Isn't that real? I said my be. <laughs> to google maps i just assumed i was just looking so it sounds welsh maybe i don't know it's the latin name given by the romans to the land in today's scotland north of their province of it's Britannia. scotland oh Sc yeah it's the old name for scotland <laughs> it's scotland <laughs> okay that's lame their name's lame next <laughs> oh no <laughs> i'm going to scotland for a wedding soon i've never been i hope it's great it's very cold but it's also very beautiful Scotland's a nice place. It's cool that they got to make their own studio, though. That's really nice. It's really nice when developers can get together and start studios and actually do that massive undertaking, you know? I really respect people who go after that. It's crazy. Yeah, and all the legal work for it and blah, 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 blah. It's a big step. <sighs> I know. Hence why I'll probably never do it. Oh, you'll get there. I'd rather, re I'd rather research games than make them, I think. <laughs> well, that's also fair, too. <laughs> all right. Uh, so... On the 29th of September, Xbox Live Indie Games was supposed to shut down, but um, Xbox announced that it will be delayed to October. So uh, Eurogamer initially reported on this. I, don't, I haven't updated it since the 29th. Um, it's a couple of days after that. But basically Eurogamer reported then that Xbox Live Indie Games won't be shut down on the 29th of September and that a Microsoft UK spokesperson and that they've heard from Microsoft that it will be online until the 7th of October. Why are they shutting it down anyway? They have the ID at Xbox program and the creators program. So the creators program we spoke about, what was it, a month ago or two months ago, um, which is where indie studios can upload indie games without having to pay. Mm. I think it was, I can't remember how much it was, but without having to pay to put it on. But they can't have things like achievements and I don't think they can have online play either. Yeah. Uh, and then they have the idea xbox program which is 
which kind of stemmed from uh, Xbox Live Indie Games program and is kind of the program now that they want to focus more on. Hmm. Yeah, idea I, I text box always has a stand at EGX these days. Uh, Rez and the main one. Yeah, it's you, yeah. So I think the reason they're getting of XBLIG is that they didn't transfer XBLIG onto Xbox One, whereas idea Xbox carried on. And so, on Xbox 360, after the 7th of October, you can't buy any more indie games. Well, are they doing something to replace it? Uh, not for Xbox 360, but ID oh, Xbox. Oh, yeah, yeah. Basically... So there's more Xboxes. Yeah. I, I don't know consoles, man. I'm just like, <laughs> Xbox, Xbox X, Xbox X, 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 O, but... <laughs> Odd names, PS4 Pro... What's what? The, what's the There's a Xbox PS4 one? Pro. The 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 new one is the Xbox One XS, isn't it? Something SX. What? Sorry, Xbox One SX. Yeah. I think they need someone to name their shit better. <laughs> Who who's signing off on these ideas? I need to speak with them. This is so so. What? We're speak with X- Bill and Bill and um, PR. Xbox One XS. That's the most confusing name I've ever heard in my entire existence. And my name is Jupiter. Okay, Xbox One XS. I mean, Xbox One was confusing as enough. Yeah, the progression so far has been Xbox, Xbox 360, Xbox One. Yeah, but I could deal with that. All right, like you made bad choices, but you know it's excusable. However, the Xbox XS. No! Ugh. You've done that on purpose. I'm moving. Whatever. Whatever. No, um, I, I, to be honest, I agree with the naming conventions. PS, buy a new PS4 Xbox. Pro kind of makes sense. But, well, it, it, really. makes, it makes sense because it's still a PlayStation 4, but it's like the bigger, ver- it's like the better version. Is there a slim version of the PS4 Pro? I don't know if there is one of the PS4 Pro, but I know there's a PS4 Slim. Uh, Pro. Consoles are weird. It's almost as bad as graphics cards. <laughs> oh, <laughs> graphics yeah. cards are weirder. But I'm excited to get to the next topic, so... buy it, Get rid of your Xbox 360s. There's other ones out there. Go get one of those and play the indie games on those. The Video Look Club has announced their next game for October. The game is called Bon Bon. It's a dollar ninety-five over on Itch. Bon Bon is fucking scary. I've played it. It's a short horror story about your childhood. I'm not sure if anyone else has played it. Um, I don't know. I don't like scary games. Um, it says even if you weren't a small child in the '80s, you've been here before. Just you and your friendly toys. But this new friend, this is something you are not yet able to understand. So it's from the point of view of a of a child. And you have all of the traditional childhood stuff. I wasn't born in the 80s, I was born in the 90s. But you have, like, ring toys and blocks and balls and stuff. And they all have names. But there's, like, a really sinister thing that keeps watching you and standing in your way. And when you go near it, you start to cry a little bit and make these whimpering noises. But you can't not go near it because it's in your home. It's something that's there watching you and waiting over you no matter what you do. And it's it's a scary game, perfect for October. If you don't know, the Video uh, Game Look Club is a monthly uh, club where loads of people get together and check out um, a small game that needs some love from Itch. They have a Discord where you can talk about the game as well as gifts and some resources to share um, aspects of the game around. And you can also subscribe to their newsletter and check out all of their info in the description. So, so... I heard that we all went to EGX. <laughs> we all we all did actually. I did we too. We all went to EGX. I was there all four days. Yeah, some of us less than we wanted to be. Yeah, Kemp oh, got I did, sick. I didn't want it. I didn't want to go, but I was just forced to go. You didn't want to go. <laughs> Kemp, get out. Joseph, get out. Joseph, get out of here. Leave. No. Okay. See ya. Bye. Bye. So I'm gonna tell you about the games I liked from EGX in a fast pitching sort of way. Some of these are games that I've seen before. Some of these are games that you've probably heard from me before. Some of these are games that I've never talked about before. Welcome to my life. It's full of games. One of them, which isn't really the game I want to talk about, it's the developer. So I'm just going to kind of take over for a second. The first game I want to talk to you about is Rua. I'm probably saying the name wrong. Doesn't matter. It's out November 2nd. I'm very excited. I've seen this game at loads of different events. I'm happy that it's finally got a release date, which is so soon. I can see it in the distance. It is a sort of matching game um, where you play the character, uh, that's Rua, and basically 
Rua is in a world of dreams. Uh, you visit surrealist landscapes, decorate yourself in flowers and introspects. It's a calming, minimalistic experience with juicy interactions and cool color combinations to make you feel at ease. The urethral dreamlike soundtrack will tickle your senses and pull you in a state of peaceful flow. So it's sort of a, medi um, a meditative sort of matching game where you're given different like shapes that you have to then match out of colored um, creatures who are in your garden. And there's a beautiful story to go along with it about the main character. And it's just delightful. You can sign up now um, to their newsletter and they'll just tell you when the game's released. So you can remember. Because this is not a game to forget. It's amazing and I'm super excited it's going to be out. Did either of you get a chance to play it? No. Uh, actually. No. But A, the game looks great, and B, their website is gorgeous. Their website's spot on. Their website's great. Cool. Moving on to the next one. We talked about it last month. We'll talk about it again this month. Exposure. When we talked about this last month, I kind of thought, Joseph's got a weird sense of games that he likes. I don't know if I can trust him. <laughs> I've played the game, and I disagree with my previous self. Exposure's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's a great game. 10 out of 10. Um, it's a supernatural photography adventure game where you basically are put in this beautiful world and you get to walk around and just take pictures and play with like the exposure of the camera to solve puzzles. And it's really just so well designed and so great. It's going to be at MCM Comic Con in London in October. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm excited to see where they go with this. What they have currently is beautiful and wonderful. And I ended up writing up a little interview with the creative director where I asked them about the game and that's up on um, Big Boss Battle. And there'll be a link in the description if you want to read that because I thought it was pretty cool. I'm just going to keep going. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. I was just looking at um, the next one actually, but Exposure, I brought it up and I'm pleased to hear about your um, distrust in my game tastes. You know, it'd be before it looked like a horror game, and I was like, what the fuck, Joseph? And now it doesn't look like a horror game, because I've played it, and it wasn't. So they had some, like, issues with their website and the way it looked. But they've redone their website. It looks great. I mean, I'm so happy with them. I know. I just literally just clicked on it and being like, oh, my God, this is great. I also really like the game Akmo. Um, Akmo is a game that I saw a while ago, but it was back in my forefront of my mind at EGX. Akmo is a physics-based platformer with unique ninja rope game mechanics, precise touch-only controls, and deep gameplay. It is tough, but fair, and perfect for speedrunning. So Akmo is this like little spider octopus creature that can walk, jump, swing with rope, and pull itself up. <laughs> Combining these basic moves is where the game starts to shine. For example, pulling while swinging creates momentum, and landing at a low angle re uh, retains momentum. So you can end up like sort of getting into a flow of how this game works. Uh, it's really, really beautiful in gameplay. Very challenging. You also kill rabbits in it, which I mean, mm, is really, it's really cool to watch actually. Um, so I spent some time playing Akma. I've played it in the past, but it's really way more polished now. And um, I watched some little kids play it, and it was the best thing to watch these kids like get to the end and eat the rabbit. And they're like, ew, but it's so cool. <laughs> And also the developer played the game with a banana, which was really cool. Um, I don't know why he was just showing that he could play the game. I don't know. It stuck out in my mind. With a banana. And I th yeah, he played it with like the, the tip of a banana. Oh, oh, okay. And it's such a challenging game. It didn't make any, like, I cannot play it and get far because there's like this slime everywhere that like destroys you. But he played it with a banana and he like skillfully played it with a banana. So I'm like super impressed with that. But it's a great game. If you scroll down on the ga on the website, you can see loads of, of uh, gifts of it, and it's just really, really nice. It's like uh, Super Uber Resurrection. I remember we were playing that and just dying constantly. Yes. And the developer comes on and is just like, every level, zero deaths. Absolutely fine. <laughs> I know. It's insane. Developers on their own games. But that's a mobile game, much like Rua. Ruya, whatever. Yeah. Okay. I also very much like the game uh, Grums, G-R-U-M-Z. Um, so that was also a mobile game. Um, so basically, do they have a description? Grums introduces a fun and simple core mechanic. Constantly on the move, press anywhere to stop and navigate the incoming Grums. Beware though, as Grums come in different types, checking your reflexes and play wits. Power-ups will help you survive and score big. Beautiful visuals and sound instantly pull you into a game that belongs on every mobile device. Grums are always ready, anywhere and anytime. Are you? And this is already available on Google Play and on the App Store. Um, to be completely honest with you, I feel like I saw Super Grums at the EGX, but I can't find any like mention of Super Grums on their website, so I'm guessing this is the game. 
Um, but it was really cool. You play this, like, simplistic almost disco ball, and you kind of go up and down the screen, and you can tap to stop. But if you hold, like, your finger down for too long, excuse me, if you hold your finger down for too long, it charges you, and then you go really fast. But obstacles are coming at you at, like, either side. There's a big variety of them. Some go through portals, some fire at you, some rush across the screen. And there's also macaroni that you can collect that makes you, like, a colorful disco ball and invincible. All in all, it's really fun to play. And then there's a secondary mode when you're playing it that switches to where you stop and when you put your finger down, you move. And the goal there is to do, like, a cycle up and down the screen without, like, without stopping and avoiding everything. And you can kind of combo those up to get more points. I just thought it was really simple, but the graphics was, like, stunning for minimalism. And it was just really well made. It was unique, but for whatever reason, like, innovative is the idea, I guess, because you could pick it up and you understood it really fast, but it's so unique and different. And it's out now, so you can download it and play it. Cool. I was, I was out now. But, yeah, it's out now. Download it, iOS and Android, now. Play it, now. No, I'm going to get it now. <laughs> Sorry. I was doing weird stuff. Um, another game that I've seen before, but Lewis fell in love with, with uh was insane robots Lewis, do you want to come guest on our podcast and uh talk about insane robots all right this is gonna fast pitch insane robots he really loves this game every time we're at an event he has to play it and this time he played it with the developer and beat the developer which is really cool so pitch insane robots uh insane robots is like fusing a card game with turn-based sort of hex tile movement um, it's so described you... as hearthstone meets the hunger games procedural robot survival arenas fought with friend fiendish card battles so it's a lot of a lot of thinking involved it gets strategic quite quickly um to be honest to get into the depths of it you have to play a demo for a while so if you're at an event you know but i played the dev i beat the dev she was saying that I would probably not beat the dev. And I was I saying did. that he probably wouldn't beat the dev, and but he, he did. We had a good fight. It was good. We asked a long time. Essentially, it's like you move around the map on hex tiles. Um, when you encounter another robot, I won't get into the story of why you fight them and you have attack that you have to build, defense that you have to build, um, and you have other cards that can like you can swap your attack slot for their attack slot. You can randomize either your opponents or yours. There's lots of random cards you can add in um, and boost and things of that nature. But also outside of that, when you move around this hex tile map, there's shops and things you can pick up and acquire. Vending that give machines. Permanent bonuses. Yeah, like a broken vending machine or a crashed chip or whatever it might be. Um, and you keep that progressively throughout the campaign, throughout the story that you go through. So why do you like this game? Why does it stick out to you? It's not something I've seen combined in that way before. I've seen a lot of com you know, card games with twists, but I feel like this is really... It sort of takes a card game and makes it quite strategic. Um, I like that there is some sort of progression, but it's also customized progression. You get given options. You can never take all of them because, well, you don't have enough money or parts or whatever. Um, there are absolutely tons of different characters in that. There's a cat there robot. Are- as tons. well that's cute i like the cat robot a lot yeah and you can play all of them and fight them and i think that's amazing um oh. yeah it's just very strategic it's very good fun thank you very much lewis for being a part of this have fun editing this later cool so i've never seen lewis so excited about an indie game and he loves this one and he goes to a lot of events with me and has a more refined taste in games than i do so feel free to sign up for their newsletter i'm signed up to their newsletter i get emails very occasionally from them and they're mainly just Really nice things that tell me what's going on in the game. So it's great. It, so was Lewis officially our first guest star then? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Dun, Lewis, dun, you were our first guest star. We're growing. He said amazing. Swiftly moving on with the wind, we're going to talk about Ava Airborne. I've seen Ava Airborne before as well. I saw it at Gameo or Gameo, depending on if you're from the north and know how to actually pronounce it or not. Um, that's an event that happens in Manchester. Basically, it's a game by Laser Dog. And it's great. You are Ava, who, you know, really likes flying in the wind. You have different ways of flying, and you fly through the sky full of obstacles. There are loads of obstacles. A lot of them hurt you, like lasers and um, big balloons. Um, just kidding. The balloons are supposed to help you. There's, like, a trampoline on top. But, yeah, I never hit the trampoline. I always just hit the balloon head on and die. Balloons that you can pop. Um, 
tons of stuff. It's a very addictive game. It's one of those games that you play and you go, one more go, and then you've been playing for half an hour and you're like, one more go, and then you've been playing for four hours and you're still saying one more go. The variety of different um, flight equipment that Ava has to start off the game is really, really nice. Um, in the EGX version, it like cycled through them at random. And it's um, the way that you control Ava is pretty unique because you kind of have to glide as opposed to flying constantly because you only have a limited amount of time that you can fly forward. So you have to learn how to kind of glide and use the things in the air to your advantage. A video will show this way better. So if you're watching the video version of this podcast, you'll see it way better. I have played this game primarily on Apple TV. TV, which I think is the best way to play it. I honestly think that I'm getting more and more into video games on TV. I really hope they poured it over to the Amazon TV because like having that remote control and doing that feedback with a one button remote, it just feels so right. It feels so right and like it belongs and is a part of the game. So I'm very excited to see where they go with it. It has changed a lot since the first time I saw it. The first time I saw it had like a big story behind it, but they've decided to just make it an arcade game without a story. And I think it's a great move for them because I don't think the story was very needed. And I think that to implement the things that they were doing didn't quite make sense with the way that it's currently going now. And it's super fun to play as is. So yeah, I'm really excited to see what they do. <sighs> cool. I feel like I picked out too many games because I'm just talking. <laughs> You do love your games. Sorry? We love video games. I only have a couple more, I promise. Another game that I want to mention quite quickly is Mechanic Panic. It's a co-op couch game designed for all ages as a team of one to four players. You and your friends must race against the clock to repair and replace parts, paint bodywork, and prepare vehicles ready for their test drive so that they can be returned to customers. Fix up and cash out in as many cars as possible to earn cash for upgrades, unlock, unlocks in the aim of escaping the system and building your own company. So this is a game made by students, um, and it's kind of like Overcooked, but with cars, and that's, that, I'm sold, it's Overcooked, but with, so, with cars and robots, sold. So you play these robots, and you're just kind of grabbing parts that are on conveyor belts, or on various tables, and you're building a car, and the player that has the most effect on the car wins overall, but really you're all just trying to work together, and like, follow the story and stuff. There's not quite, I didn't get to see much to it, but... I really, really liked how it was coming along, and I think that we need more couch co-op games that are not about killing, and this is one of them, and it's nice. It's a nice couch co-op that's not about me killing other people, and that's just what I need in my life right now, so good job. It looks really nice. Um, Always interesting to see more couch co-op stuff, especially for younger audiences. Yes, Um, and I think it would be a nice game for just, like, for people who like cars, you get to build the cars. It's really fun. I built a load of um, Volkswagen Beetles. It was great. Uh, uh, we should have played together. I would have loved to have played that, actually. Ah, <sighs> You should have played with me. You should have hung out with me more. I should do, actually. That's a good, that's a good point in general. Yes. The next game we're going to talk about is Boom Boom Barbarian. Boom Boom Barbarian I have seen before. I saw it and judged it at the Big Indie Pitch a while ago. However... I love Boom Boom Barbarian. I loved it then. I love it now. It is a great game. It's a rhythm-based game where you're killing things. A lot of people are kind of down on it. And they're like, "Mm, the music. mm." No, it's a brilliant game. Trust me. I play a lot of games. This game's brilliant. Trust me. So, you're this, like, badass hero. And you get to pick some other badass heroes that help you out. And basically, you kill people to the rhythm of brilliant songs. And, you know, as you're coming and they're killing things, you also have, like, your other heroes that you can kind of switch to. Um, not switch to, but you can activate them. They, like, build back up your forces or attack even more. Stuff like that. I think the soundtrack's great, especially for a rhythm game. It's just spot on. The game plays wonderful. It's great to play with a controller. I prefer the mobile version. However, the you know, it's great to play with a controller. The art's really great, too. I don't know. It's just a great rhythm game. It's just great. Yeah, I was, it's just great. I was just listening to it and thought the audio design was spot on. Audio... Both the music and the actual audio timing and implementation was pretty amazing. It's brilliant. It's a really, really, really good game. Like, it really is. And I don't even like rhythm games, and I think this game's fantastic. All right, a couple more games, a couple more games. I really also liked Falling Sky. Falling Sky was in the um, NFTS. Yeah, the National Film Television School booth. So I really love these booths. And if you go to gaming events and there are booths that are dedicated to students, just listen to me. Just listen to me. Go check them out. Like, these students are the future of game development. These students are studying and they're at these events to gain knowledge on how to be better at what they're doing. 
And NFTS always tries to get their students into showcasing their game because it's a big part of development, having play testers, learning about marketing, building a brand. That's a big, big part of development. And NFTS does a great job of giving um, their students a booth and the resources and tools to showcase their games. With that said, these are student games, and they're not all going to be fantastic. They're going to have bugs. It's going to be their first time showing them off. It's going to be their first time having play tests, and they know their games aren't great. But I just think that everyone should go and support them, and you should check out their games, and you should see where they're heading and the future of what they're making. With that said, there was one game that really, really stood out, and it was called Falling Sky. It's a bold cinematic game set across the sprawling landscape of America, of American suburbia. The game follows Daniel and his younger brother, Tommy, as they embark on a quest to solve the mystery of their mother's disappearance. With only a series of cryptic messages to guide them, the brothers set off on a dangerous quest to discover the truth. Falling Sky is an ambitious student game that not only embraces um, motion caption to bring to life the story, but also stars industry stalwarts Stefan Cornicard? Yep, Stefan Cornicard. Stefan Cornicard and Christy Mayer from famed for their roles in Horizon, Zero Dawn, Dark Souls, and Dragon Age Inquisition. So this is like a student game that's got like all of these resources poured into it, which is really cool. Um, there was only a short demo at EGX, but it's like, you know, a narrative-driven, uh, 3D motion capture created game that's voice acted, and it's kind of mysterious. You've just come home from college, you can't, you haven't been able to get a hold of like your mom or your brother for a long time, and you find your brother is basically starving inside the house he doesn't remember the last time he ate your mom's gone you don't know why he doesn't understand and he's clearly been ne neglected and he's been given all of these rules that he has to follow and you don't quite understand what these rules are about and you you take him out of the house which is against the rules and he's a bit reluctant at first but you get him out of the house and the transition from like this 3D house exploration to this top-down map view and then back to these like cinematic scenes. It's wonderful. This is a great game. It's obviously going somewhere. I really hope that the guys working on it continue it. It's really great. I'm looking forward to seeing more of it. It's just like a little teaser. They want to have loads of different episodes of this story. And I find the story to be captivating and just interesting. This little boy left on his own. What's happened? Where's the mom gone? There's just lots of really little details that have been looked at this game, especially for a student game. It's, it's just great. I don't have a bad thing to say about it. It's really wonderful. Um, there was also some other student builds, though, from that area that I kind of want to talk about. All of the games are really wonderful. All of them had their own little kinks in them. Um, there was a VR-based game called Mouse in the House. I think it was called Mouse in a House. I feel like I need to look up these names, but it's very, very hard to look up these names. Because they're all student builds. <laughs> okay, I'll talk about this one. There's a game called uh, Supremely Excellent Goblins, and that is a very, very cute game where you are this little, little goblin and you're traveling around inside these dungeons and there's bad guys and you're kind of collecting other parts of goblins. Um, and sometimes you play a human when you're like low on health, and that was just really wonderful. And I thought it was an adorable Pixar game. I haven't seen a lot of Pixar games from them. Um... So it was really cool to see that showcased. It was really cute and really well done. There was also a game called May, and I just I kind of want to talk about the developer of the game called May, not so much about the game. So that's another interesting thing. When you go to these um, games and you see that they're student builds, uh, as I said, they're, they're buggy. And May was particularly buggy. It was about this Mayflower, and the story behind it was so wonderful. He had like little printouts that told you about the story. And the idea was you played May, and May is a Mayfly, and mayflies, they don't live very long. They die. Um, but you are playing the single day that this mayfly is alive. And as you go through the day, you kind of solve obstacles and you lose your abilities. And you're unable to continue. And the mayfly that you're, your partner that you're traveling with, it dies. And you have to carry it. And meanwhile, in the background, it's just a normal day. And the developer wanted to add humans in the background, like taking life for granted, to continue to push like this idea of like this mayfly, this mayfly being so fragile and only having one day while the rest of us take so much for granted. And it was wonderful. The game was kind of unplayable. It was really, really buggy to the point where the developer was kind of reluctant to let people play. And I felt kind of bad for him because he was reluctant to let people play this brilliant, brilliant concept that he had. And it was a prototype. And I got to sit down and play it, and the developer really sold the game to me. 
he was so happy and upbeat and willing to walk you through the tutorial and just play off this bugginess um, in such a way that it was... He shined. He shined more than his game did. And he left a lasting impression positively uh, for something that was a game that was unplayable. And that's, that's like a skill in itself. Being able to sell yourself and sell your product to the point where you as a person makes so much of an impact that's positive that you stay in someone's mind. And I felt like he was so great about his game and so great about where it could go. And I didn't, I didn't feel bad that it didn't work. I didn't mind that his game was unplayable. It's still a game that stood out to me because he shined and he stood out to me. And I was just really happy that I got to have that experience with him. Aww. I think it's important to talk about that. Um, another game I really liked from the area was the mouse, uh, the house mouse VR. And that was a VR game where you sat in a swivel chair and it was again, uh, quite glitchy, but you basically were a mouse that needed to steal some pizza from some humans and not be spotted by a cat. Um, I don't play a lot of VR games. This was the only VR game I tried at this event. I don't like VR games. However, they put me in a swivel chair and then I moved the swivel chair to where I wanted to like the direction I wanted to like, what is it called? Scurry in. So I thought that was a really great implementation <laughs> of great. like VR. It didn't make me feel sick at all, which was fantastic. And the guy was so upbeat. Um, but yeah, that's it. Really, those are all the ones that, that really stuck out. You know, sometimes you go to events and your game might not be fun, might not be in its best playable state, but. As long as you are passionate about it and can convey that passion, people will really yes. respond well um, to the game. Yeah, and you could see like the work that he did put into what was there, and you could hear the like passion in his voice, and just a slight bit of disappointment at first that he wasn't able to get so much stuff done. But ah, he's just, he's going to make great games in the future. Like, even if he didn't have the perfect game at EGX, he's going to make great games in the future. And him himself is a great person and clearly deserves to go places, in my opinion. Cool, cool. Yeah, that's the end of the games I had to talk about at EGX, so... Oh, we can enter the, the Kemp portion of the EGX. Uh, show here. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I've got a, a few on my list. Uh, first up is Bomber Crew. Out October um, 19th. So Sorry. I, I, I should say a few of these games, I kept taking people over to play them and never actually ended up playing myself. Yeah, so let me tell you about Kemp at events. He just wants to I, watch yeah, everyone really let's weird. play. He doesn't, he's not there to play the games. He wants to watch people live let's play. I like watching people play for two reasons. So, firstly, when when you're watching, you see more than when you're playing. Because when you're playing, you're very focused on what's the next thing I need to do. Whereas when you're watching, you can see you see all the things that are happening. And secondly, you can jump in halfway through and when there's actually things happening. So the tutorial, the inevitable tutorial at the start is always very slow and sort of builds you up. But when you're watching, you just jump straight in when actual action is happening. So I'm going to defend my position like that. Well, I'll take your defense and I'll say, tell me about Bomber Crew. Yes, Bomber Crew. So basically, I went in having heard of this described as FTL in a World War II bomber. I've heard that same description. Yeah, and it is, it's very apt. Uh, basically, you don't control the bomber, you control the crew in the bomber. So you sign on to various stations and they'll do the thing, like they'll repair broken bits of the plane or they'll fly the plane or they'll drop bombs and all that sort of thing. But you do have a lot more control over everything than you do in FTL, sort of in the bigger scheme of things. Like you, you plot out the flight paths for the missions hmm. and you have to watch that the plane actually does stay on the right path and you pick the targets. It's very open world compared to FTL, like you you decide what missions you want to do and you plot out the the routes for the missions and so on. Okay. And it's got this very cartoony uh, graphical style um, and I just really like how it looks and it looks like oh a lot of fun. God, this looks great. I didn't get to see it in person but I heard a lot of good things about it and I've seen the trailer and it looks like a pretty interesting game. 
I'm at, I'm actually I'm actually literally right now adding that to my wish list because that is a very a, the thing is is the the gifts and the videos of it are gorgeous and it looks almost looks like a more whimsical FTL as well. I don't know if whimsical is the right word, but a bit more of a yeah, the like the color palettes a lot. It's kind of yeah. brighter, There's... I guess, more colorful. Because FTL is very black and a few and, and the simulation aspect and... allows for you know some like interesting stuff. So one of the gifts they include is them landing, not even hitting the runway, and just you know managing to land without using the runway. It, it's sort of one of those games where I, I assume everyone knows about it, and then I mention. Yeah, it I've not heard of this, don't. but I'm really pleased I do now. So the next game uh, that hasn't been mentioned yet on my list is Off Grid. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, a sort of stealth um, game. You play as a just normal nobody who just gets dragged into this big thing that's happening. And uh, I believe, um, so I'm going on vague memories of the f what isn't actually the first level apparently. Uh, that was on the show there, but I believe they kidnap your daughter and they make you infiltrate this these offices to steal some information and then the plot just sort of escalates from there. And it's... A, at first it looks like a reasonably standard stealth game, but there's a lot of tech stuff in there. Uh, like, you've, uh, basically you have devices that let you see other computers in the building and you can uh, remotely hack them and steal information from them and all that sort of thing and it actually has this really nice visualization of the connections between all the devices and the buildings and just graphically it's very nice so it's very low poly actually mm. the game um but it actually looks really nice for it and there's a I, I guess a bug but they said they might leave it in just because it's so amusing where if you're crouching and you clip slightly into a door and then Act, then activate the door to like open it your arm does this spaghetti thing where it just wildly flails around <laughs> as it grabs the handle that sounds and a lot like I don't a feature to me yeah i don't know why that <laughs> stuck out but that just like that really amused me uh, so i've played um off grid a lot because it well, was not a lot i've played it at a couple of other events because it's um the developers i believe are very local to me and um it's, it's really coming along it's very complex especially from what it looks like but yeah yeah my exposure really nice. with the developers is that when i was doing some work on a specific type of ai i spoke to them um about that kind of ai because they're looking into helping having systems where you social social engineer the outcomes and what the gods do yes um, I spoke to I spoke to them in an interview and they were saying that they wanted what they were aiming for was that you know one of the things they kept bringing up was that the soap dispensers in the in their world are also the same people who brought out um rat traps um and you can mess up with through the mouse traps you can mess up the soap dispenser so that what they have to do is they have to use the soap dispenser to leave, but because it's broken, they can't leave the bathroom. So you can lock people within the bathroom um, through the game, and you can put them there by sending them adverts of coffee and stuff, and they go get a drink, and then they need a toilet. And there was a really interesting system to hear about, um, especially some of the AI stuff they do behind it. Yeah, they're telling a, a similar story there, actually. Um... In this case, they're so talking about just completely remotely emptying the soap dispensers, just like continually activating them remotely after hacking them. And then, of course, someone goes in, goes to the toilet, wash, can't wash their hands because there's no soap left, but the to the actual room won't let them out because they haven't washed their hands yet. No, it's... it's I, I'm very interested to see how this goes. I'm very excited to... I, unfortunately, I didn't manage to actually play it whilst talking to the guys, but... Um... I'm really excited to see where it goes. Yeah, so actually a good comparison someone made uh, with Off Grid was um, sort of a deeper, more complex uh, gunpoint. Okay. Because mm. uh, you had the, the, hack, you had the ability to hack systems and connect them in unexpected ways and such in there, which I, I guess is, if you don't know the game at all, that's sort of a place you could come from to sort of think about it. Uh, so next on my list, uh, Mega Aquarium. 
Again, another game that I assume everyone's heard of, but I, I find people who haven't, so I've why not mention it. it. Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, it's in the style of old school sim games like Sim Hospital, but you run an aquarium. And it's very easy on the eyes, and it seems like it'd be a very relaxing game as long as nothing's going c catastrophically wrong. And it's um, the sort of game that I could probably really get into. Um, I know, I mean, I, I know lots of people that I know really like the idea of the game, so. But yeah, you've you've played it, Jupiter? Yeah, I played it at EGX Res, I believe. Yeah, so. Oh yeah, they were at Res, yeah. Yeah, so they're, it's a really cool game because you're creating this sort of, it's kind of like an aquarium tycoon. You're kind of creating this aquarium that people come and enjoy. Uh, Lewis had fish in the past so i really like fish and i like the way fish work and the thing about um uh, mega aquarium is that they have actually got a scientist i think it is so they have a marine biologist working with them to make sure that everything's kind of like realistic and sound for how an aquarium would work and i think that attention to detail is quite amazing um so props to them yeah definitely yep uh i i said sim hospital didn't i earlier yep. Sim hospital yeah brain not working <laughs> that's okay yeah, I think it's a good game. I'm glad it's in your favourites. Yep. Uh, and finally on my list, Cube 2. I assume you pronounced it Cube. It's spelled with a Q. Um, so Emma, this, I've, I, I guess, have, I if you've never something. heard of the game before, the easiest way to oh, come at this conceptually no is it's like Portal, without portals. It has its own unique mechanics, but it's, um, sort of, it starts out with the... <laughs> And it has physics puzzles to get through various rooms and a very minimalistic colour scheme, but there's a lot of, lot of detail red, in the levels. So while there's not much colour, it's not very plain, if you know what I mean. Uh, but yeah, it's um, the part they had on show at EGX uh, introduced you to, I believe, uh, three or four mechanics and just got to gradually build them up to make more complex puzzles, and you can see. It'll get really complex in the final game by the end, but it looks like a lot of fun, and it's it is that is my sort of game when I'm in the mood for that sort of thing. I, I enjoy that a lot. the The mechanics they had on show there were basically you have specific blocks you can modify, so you can make them bounce you when you touch them. You can extrude out sort of a, a long block from it uh, to make a platform or to raise you up and there was another one oh uh, one that you can extrude or lava drop a block out of. Uh, so you can combine that with say the bouncing pads to bounce it across the level and so on but yeah it uh, looks like a lot of fun have you played the first version of this game um the f n no actually oddly enough i own it but i've never played it uh, I had completely the wrong impression of what type of game it was, and just never got around to it. And now, having seen Cube 2 there, suddenly I've realised, oh, actually, the first one might be something I'm interested in. Next, we're moving on to a selection of indie releases. Um, do you want me to read the first one? Oh, wait, you haven't actually spoken in a while. Why don't you... You didn't tell us any of your favourites, Joseph, from EGX. <laughs> How what dare you? What the fuck's you? going on here? <laughs> All right, do we throw my favourites from EGX? Yeah, throw in your favorites for EGX, uh, God damn it! Yeah, this only... is all about EGX. So I've managed to play two games. That's it! Both of which are the one on the list. Uh, mainly because... So I'll, I will prefix this with something. That my aim for EGX was to look at interesting applications of artificial intelligence systems and machine learning systems in indie games. And because it's so niche, there weren't too many games that you know that were really focusing on ai um so the ones i did find so off grid that we spoke about they're using interesting ai um that i will elaborate further in a article slash video at some point um i also went to see the people uh, i also went to look at a game called the occupation which is made by white paper games who made is it ether one I think it was their first game. And the occupation is set in Northwest England, 1980s, and it's very much around a governmental conspiracy where you need to um, socially 
um, sneak, almost socially sneak your way through buildings and get to the bottom of a conspiracy and figure out basically what's going on and how you can stop it. And the interesting thing about it is that there are only seven characters in the entire game. And these characters are all fully fleshed out and the ones you, the only ones you'll ever interact with. And as part of that, they have, they've they been building a very interesting system around uh, not only making the, the characters engaging, interesting, um, and uh, I guess co cohesive, I think the word is as well. They're also making a very interesting system in how they can change the characters' personalities very quickly if they need to. Mm. And so for me, that was super interesting. And then the other game I had a look at, which Jupiter very kindly introduced me to, ah. it was called It's Quiz Time. And It's Quiz Time is interesting because they've been using text-to-speech and real-time... I can't remember what the word is. It's basically real-time facial... Recognition? Uh, real-time... Uh, facial animation based on the words that their TV host Sally is speaking. And so their aims were to build a likeable TV host that can react to players, their decisions, how they're doing, and even um, their preferred gender and their age as well. So another interesting fact about that game is that it tailors its questions based on your age. So when I, when I played and put my age in, um, I got some... I got get I got lots of questions around about you know late nineties early two thousands, and I was playing with someone who was in their thirties forties, and they got questions around the eighties, um, late eighties, early nineties, and so mm. there was kind of like a little bit of overlap. And the other interesting thing is that they have nine thousand questions on their game at the moment, and the way they do that is they manage to data mine information on the internet to make the questions which is incredible and hopefully i'll be able to look a bit further into it but yeah that was my egx was looking very way too much into three very interesting games for me rather than going around and playing a lot of different games oh also there was another game that i played which i think is zero degrees north and was it i'm gonna double check Feel free uh, yeah, to... zero degrees north, zero degrees west, I believe. But basically, uh, this game, the developer of this game, who built it on his own, basically built uh, a lot of levels based off of his dreams. And he learned how to build shaders. Um, he learned to kind of compose, uh, write and compose music. Learned about 3D modeling. And basically managed to turn this kind of purest form of expression since it is i wouldn't really call it as a game but more as an artistic expression of um himself and his dreams um he managed to use this into kind of like a learning experience for him to learn more about game development design and it's really it's a really interesting meditative exploration and you can think as hard or as shallow as you want with it you can try and think very hard about the subtleties and the meanings behind the design the uh, shady usage and the music or you can just enjoy it for what it is on a very surface level and enjoy the calm uh the calmness of the scenes and there's another game i managed to play which i thought was uh, really interesting it's not really a game i'd say but if you're really interested in games as art and games as expression then this is one you should definitely check out and I think that's my EGX. Did you have a good time? Did everyone have a good time at EGX? Yeah, it was great. When I was there, yeah. I had to leave halfway through because I was became ill, but... Oh, no. Uh, luckily, I was there for the two quiet days, so I could actually look at things and then ended up missing the two busy days. So you win some, you lose some. It was actually incredibly busy on the actual busy days. Yeah, oh yeah, very, and very last year when I went, uh, Saturday especially was just insane. Really? Oh yeah, just packed. I mean, you, it gets so hot in the uh, in NEC as well. Um, moving on to our selection of indie releases for this month. The first one we're going to talk about is Tooth and Tail, 
Tooth and Tail is a popcorn RTS for veterans and newcomers alike. Developed by Pocket Watch Games, the game follows the story of the Long Coats, the Common Folk, and the KSR and the Civilized in the midst of a civil war over who gets to eat and who gets to be the meat. A dark, humorous tale of riots and revolution is told through an extensive single-player campaign. This game looks super interesting. It's got really, really, really nice graphics. Is it pixel art? It kind of looks like pixel art. I feel like it's pixel art. Uh, it's like a modern pixel art with some interesting shading. Um, I love the kind of style and aesthetics. And I also, I think my favorite description of it was the it's a it's a Hearthstone Starcraft is what some people have been saying, which is basically like you know like a more casual RTS. Cool. It's only fourteen pounds ninety nine. Apparently, it's got like pick up and play matches, so it lasts for like fifteen to twelve. Uh, sorry, five to twelve minutes. Um, and you can play it uh, split screen couch play with a game pad So that's quite nice that it's got small rounds so you can play Kemp. Yeah, they they had me at five to twelve minute sessions there Perfect. <laughs> it's also got online uh, competitive play Multiplayer looks like a decent game. I like the look of the characters. The art style is brilliant Cool cool. Do you want to read the next one? Uh, okay, should I talk about divinity quickly? Yeah, go for it. So, Divinity Original Sin 2 came out. If you played the original D Divinity, it's a, it's basically a top-down RPG, similar, drawing inspiration from, from actual tabletop games like Dungeons & Dragons. We've got some really interesting uh, game mechanics around environmental effects, as well as the fact that you can kill literally anyone, and you just have to deal with the consequences with a very extensive story and up to four player co-op. Uh, I think probably everyone may have heard of it, but it is an indie game. So I thought I'd put it up there. It's 30 bucks, 29.99. 29.99 pounds, not bucks. Sorry, it's 29.99 pounds. Cool. So the next game we have on the list, I don't know how to transition between these games, is Hive Swap Act 1. It's a hand-drawn tribute to hilarious 90 adventure games with none of the accompanying frustration. Play as Joey Claire, a puzzle-solving teen snatched out of her time, 1994, and place, Earth, and stranded on a hostile alien planet on the brink of, on the brink of rebellion. This game looks adorable. I'm loving the graphic style, though I feel like she doesn't quite blend in with the background the way that I want her to. But that's okay. I have issues with games that don't blend in quite perfectly but that's my issue it looks adorable i love games that talk about the 90s the 90s was the best time period to be alive ever it's got some great reviews on steam and it is five pounds 59 so is a cheap game pick it up she's got like a weird old cell phone walkie talkie as well this looks great it, it does look really nice to be fair it's probably because it is really nice all right who wants to talk about echo uh, did we talk about it since I talked about it last? Uh, uh, be before you talk about you it, talk about should, it, should I? So I, I went through and made a quick note on some games. Should I, should I tell you what my my note for Echo is? What's what? your note for Echo? The scenery of Bloodborne, palette of Mirror's Edge, gameplay somewhere between Resident Evil and Dead Space. <laughs> That's an interesting combination, actually. Cool. Do you want to read the thing? Camp. Kemp, I don't know what any of the games that you listed mean. Please read out the description. Me? I'm, I, yeah. I'm not an Echo person. I've, I've, this Today is actually the first time I've seen this game, but it looks really good. We talked about it on a previous podcast, Kemp. Previous podcast? Yeah, with you. You were there. Last month. Have, have we talked about Echo before? Yes, yeah, we have. Well, yeah, we spoke about it in Kemp. upcoming games last month. Kemp! Oh, Kemp! Really? I, I honestly we don't did. remember this. Kev, why are you here? I, I really wish I did remember because this looks like a good game. Kev, I'll read it. Kev doesn't even know the game. I remember the... Echo. Echo, after a century in stasis, the girl, Ian, N, arrives at her destination, a palace out of a legend. Out here, using forgotten technology, she hopes to bring back a life that shouldn't have been lost. But nothing could prepare for what she'll face in the ancient halls below. The experience starts as a character-driven journey of discovery, but as it unfolds, it evolves into something altogether more punishing. 
The palace studies everything you do, everything you are, to use it against you. Gameplay revolves around stealth, action, manipulation, uh, and manipulation as you face off against the ultimate enemy, yourself. So, I find games that claim that they sort of um, use your actions to change the game to be really interesting. And I think that that's great that games end up um, almost... That games, I don't know, I haven't played this one to be completely honest, but that games are getting to a point where it sort of tailors itself to the player. And Echo is only £18.99. That's how much it cost. And it's got positive reviews on Steam as well. It's very positive. It yeah, looks it's... really stunning. It really does. I'm, I'm looking at these interior shots and it's got these really elaborate um, sort of big rooms with all sorts of detail. Uh, but a very simple colour scheme, so it doesn't look cluttered, and the things that need to stand out still stand out. It looks really nice. Yeah. Awesome. So the next one is Super Fancy Pants Adventure. I saw Super Fancy Pants Adventure at Gamescom and was like, hey, this is a Flash game. And the developer replied, no, it's not. And I was like, what do you mean? And that was great. So the Fancy Pants Adventure series started over 10 years ago by Brad Bone, an indie developer who wanted to redefine video game platforming by making speed and tight controls feel compatible. Over the years, he has honed his craft, turning his Fancy Pants games into a worldwide phenomenon with over 10 million plays, becoming one of the top games of all time on Congregate. This newer version, Super Fancy Pants Adventure, is a culmination uh, and a reimagination of the series into a full-fledged title. Whether it's your first time playing Fancy Pants or your hundredth, Super Fancy Pants Adventures is a wild run. So my sister used to play the original Fancy Pants, and she used to bring her friends over to my house, sit in my living room. Well, I mean, it was her house too, it was our parents' house. Sit in my living room and show me up on this game. And that was my childhood. It was her and her friends beating my fucking times on Super Fancy Pants. And I was always pissed. I was always like, this is bullshit. I'm the best <laughs> gamer of the house. I'm going to have a career in the games industry someday. How dare you be better than... But she was. She was better than me. So when I saw this at EGX and, like, the Congregate booth, I was like, what the fuck? This game's come back to haunt me. However, this, like, newer version of the game is so much more than Fancy Pants. It's got the character you love, the Fancy Pants character, and it's got the same controls that you love. But it's actually brought out to be, like, a full, complete, like, juicy-feeling game as, a, as opposed to just a small Flash game. And it's really cool to see Congregate, like, funding this game and backing, like, indie games. As we were talking about last month, Congregate started to back indie games. And this is one of them. Um, so the game is only £6.99 over on Steam. And if you remember the Flash game, if you want to bring back the Flash game, if you've got a sister who's not as good as video games as she was before, and you kind of want to give her the, the old game to see that you can now beat her scores because you play video games professionally, yeah, you, you should pick it up. <laughs> you, you're not, you don't hold anything, do you? <laughs> no, no, never. I don't hold anything ever. See, I one, one thing I do love um, is when Flash games get expanded on and become bigger. Uh, like N, I know we've mentioned N before. It started out as a flash game, and now it's on all the platforms, and it's got like multiple different like sequels, and I, I just love that sort of thing. But anyway, do you want to talk about Heat Signature Camp? I think Joseph is involved here as well. Heat Signature is a game that we both seem guys, to be enjoying. Do you boys want to talk about it? Um, we can we can both talk. Well, we can all we can all jump in, but um. Okay, I'll start. I have no opinion on this game. <laughs> it's ten pounds ninety nine. It's 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 <laughs> worth it. It's worth it. It really is. I'm not, I'm not sponsored or anything, but I'm heavily biased because I'm fuck. I love this game. I thought you were gonna say because I'm fucking this game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that, that is a whole different <laughs> podcast. <laughs> don't 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 tell anyone. Um, basically, heat signature. Uh, is a game for the developers of Gunpoint, uh, Suspicious Development. To be honest, I don't even need to say the game. You should just l watch the trailer on the Steam store. It's fantastic. It's perfectly British humor. But basically, the game is you break into spaceships, uh, you make terrible mistakes, and think of clever ways out of them. You take a mission, you fly to the target ship, sneak inside, and make a clever use of your gadgets to distract, ambush, and take out the crew. I have found this game extremely fun, for two reasons. One, stopping time and having time to think about how you're going to figure out the mess you've got yourself into is incredibly um, 
rewarding. It's a lot better than just, you know, having to real time deal with stuff. It's a lot less stressful too. But two, missions will usually last only a couple, couple of minutes, if that. And so it's really good for just jumping in, playing a couple of missions and then jumping out. And I've found it really good when I'm, when I need a break from something, I just say, okay, I'm just going to do a couple of missions on heat signature. It's really engaging, really fun. And I've always had some really interesting stories come from it. Um, and Kemp was actually the person who introduced it to me when I saw his twi- tweet on it. Yeah, I, I've been all about Heat Signature around its release. Uh, I, I I mean, if you want me to keep playing your game, obviously make it interesting, but make it digestible in like 5 to 15 minute chunks, because I'll, I'll just keep coming back. It's great to fit in between other things. Kemp likes snack-sized games. Exactly. But yeah, heat signature, so much fun. So uh, other than the really easy missions, they tend to have fairly tight time limits. I think the longest I've seen it give you for a mission is two and a half minutes, three minutes. Wow, I've only seen two and a half. I've I've not even gotten to two on some of my missions. Yeah, and and quite often, like, if if a guard sees you, you'll have, like, 15 seconds to either get out or kill the captain of the ship. Uh, But you have... So you have these really tight time limits, but you can just pause it whenever you want. So you can take mm. your time to figure out how to use that time best, which is really nice. And I mean, it's it's the only game I or I know where a valid way off of a ship is just blow out a window. Yeah, that was that was when I saw Kemp say that. I was like, okay, I got I got to play this game. <laughs> yeah, just re- remotely pilot your pod out to, outside of the window and just fly out to it. I, I mean, know. Who, who could want more than that? Just play it. Just it's. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say it's just, the game. The it. game of September 2017. Yeah, I'll happily agree. I'm not sure if I agree, but just play it. <laughs> what would you? Do you have a September game of 2017? A September for so for the month of September. Um, I don't know if I have a game of September. That's a good point. All right, it can be a game of September. I don't know. Cuphead might be my game of September. What, sorry? Which game? Cuphead. Cuphead. Oh, should we just go to Cuphead while we're talking about it? Let's go to Cuphead! Cuphead! Everyone's heard of Cuphead? Cuphead! It's £14.99. It looks like old Looney Tune games, but it's not Looney Tune. Awesome. Cuphead is a classic shop. Cuphead is a classic run-and-gun action game heavily focused on boss battles inspired by cartoons of the 1930s. The visual and audio are painstakingly created with the same techniques of the era, i.e. traditional hand-drawn cell animation, watercolor backgrounds, and original jazz recordings. So that makes it really authentic. Play as Cuphead or Mugman and single-player local co-op as you transverse strange worlds, acquire new weapons, and learn powerful super moves and discover hidden secrets while you try to pay your debt back to the devil. Um, so yeah, you've probably heard of this game, you've probably seen this game, it kind of looks really amazing. I just love the art style, um, haven't actually played it. As a journalist, I'm afraid if I play it and I don't get past the tutorial, I'll have to admit it in a tweet and everyone will freak out, understandably. (laughs) However, it's overwhelmingly positive in reviews, and I very much enjoy watching other people play it, or attempt to. It is... I only have one problem with Cuphead, that in single player I can't play as Mugman. I want to play as Mugman. Get friends. <laughs> cool, cool. Moving on to Golf Story. Golf Story is a Switch-only game. It combines the sheer excitement of golf with a serious story that plays out over eight different courses. Play the story of a golfer who's forced to give up all of all that he holds dear for one last shot at accomplishing his dreams. So one thing I found out about Golf Story whilst researching it was that it was an originally, I think it was Game Boy Advance game. Okay. Um, that they've then redone and brought back for the Switch. It's uh, in pixel art, so that's kind of cool. Yeah, it looks really interesting. Um, if I had a Switch, I'd definitely want to play it. Oh, uh, speaking and... of Switch. <laughs> Sorry. Golf Story is also $14.99. I don't know how much that is in pounds. Uh, next game. We stick fight the game. I've actually bought this game and played it, so I can talk more about it. Um, Stick Fight is a physics-based couch slash online fighting game where you battle it out as the iconic stick figures from the golden age of the internet fight it out against your friends or find random sticks from around the world. So I am a 
collector of local co-op games. That's cool. Um, despite the fact I very rarely ever play them. Um, none of my friends want to play them with me, it seems. But um, the reason that I was very interested in this game was that it harked back to the ages of stick figure animations back... I can't remember what year it was. Like but back in Movie you Maker. To, yeah, you used to have... I used to even make my own stick figure animations in... Um, I think there was a stick figure movie we make. Yeah. yeah. And um, you used to see these amazingly well animated fights. And this game kind of manages to perfectly copy, well, not copy, but um, replicate? Use that style and that kind of uh, art style and bring it to the game. And it's actually a lot of fun as well. Um, and I enjoyed it. I played a bit of online. I've not managed to play Couch Cop yet, but I'm hoping to this weekend. With some friends and the lev there's a lot of really interesting levels and because everything in the level kind of changes and is dynamic then the matches are always play out very very differently and it's done very well on the reviews on steam and so i definitely recommend it and it's only three pounds 99 so this month's steam release seemed to have a theme of nostalgia um and bringing back older graphic styles and ideas, which is pretty cool. That's a good point. So, like, Super Fancy Pants, for example, uh, Cuphead, uh, Stick Fight the Game. Those are all, like, really old-looking games, almost. Not old-looking games, you know what I mean. Yeah, and Hive Swap's a tribute back to the 90s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that one, too, as well. Um, I've got two games from Itch to talk about. So, obviously, this podcast has been a bit Steam-heavy um, in the selection of indie releases and that. Um, I thought it would balance out with the number of smaller games that we talked about from EGX, but in future podcasts when we're not at events, we're going to try to incorporate more games that are released on Itch and on Game Jolt and that are released uh, for free. Um, but with that in mind, I picked out two games that look kind of cool to me that were recently released on Not Steam. Um, so the first one, uh, I'm just going to talk about these real quick, is Investor Gator 2. Investigator is back. Help him track down the thieves and kidnaps kidnappers in the second part of the Investigator saga. Um, this also includes a copy of Investigator 1 in case you missed it or need a refresher. So this game just looks really rad. I haven't played it, to be completely honest with you. However, you get to play this like little 3D cartoon investigator alligator and there's like a little sad fish that you're helping out and I think that's great. And there's also some sinister looking characters and the like font, the wording, like move and are animated, and I don't know, it just looks like a really cool game. Um, so yeah, I figured it would be worth mentioning. That reminds me of like PlayStation One. It's a short adventure game. That's what it reminds me of PlayStation One. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will take. Thank a look. you for having I opinions. I have down these so. kidnappers. Ah. I thought it looked cool. Um. Another uh, game, yeah. and this game, I'm gonna urge you guys to play it. It's called Dungeon Squeaker. Uh, it's like um, a low res pixel art game that's really looking for feedback. It just has released in development, and they want some feedback on their game. I got to judge this game at um, the Big Indie Pitch. They currently have a demo. You can play it in your browser. They have a feedback form, and it's sort of. Um, I'll read you the description. Imagine Minesweeper as an adventure game. In Dungeon Sweeper, you play Squeaker. In Dungeon Squeaker, you play as a mouse who finds a magical compass which points to the nearest threat. Oh, and the mines are cats. Uh, a mouse finds a magical compass which is bound to it by a, tu by a touch. The compass has a soul powering it which wants revenge on the dark mage who bound it. To achieve this, the compass grants the mouse uh, increasing intelligence and a more humanoid form. It deceives the innocent mouse into returning it to the wizard. So this is just a really interesting game. I played a bit of it, and I found it just, um, it's a quick game, but it's really fun. It's also got a whole level editor just embedded in the game, so you can make your own levels. Um, but you kind of just move around the playing field and, like, take on monsters and follow your compass and try to discover new areas and stuff. It's sort of turn-based, um, and it tells you where the mines are so that you don't die, which is always good. Um, but yeah, I really Something enjoyed it. So having a quick look at this, it sort of makes me think Minesweeper the roguelike. Yeah, that's like that's a great way to describe it. Um, I never really played Minesweeper, so I didn't think I was going to like it, but I really do. And they're looking for feedback just to improve the game to continue forward with it. So if you want to help out a developer and be a part of the feedback process, help out the developer and be a part of the... I, I might actually pick this up. I mean, Dungeon I mean, Squeaker is also such a cute name. I mean, 
How can it's you not It's free get this and game? you can just play it in your browser as well. I like the art. It's very good. <laughs> Please play. I definitely need feedback. I will play for you. They also have a TIG source uh, forum uh, up in case you want to provide like more detailed feedback there and be a part of the development Perfect. there. Perfect. That's always good to be part of the development process and be able to help make games better. Yeah. Um, I've actually put in a niche game. Have you? That I've been following actually for a while, and I think it came out this month. It might have been towards the end of last month, but it's called Where the Goats Are. And I've been following this developer because I've loved the look and the style of it. And it's a slow-paced meditative video game uh, for the PC and Mac. You play as Tikva as she tries to maintain her way of life, looking after goats and making cheese while the world falls around. The world around her falls apart. And so the experience lasts about an hour, and it's it's a really cool... Like, the style is really unique. I can't really think of many things that have done a very similar style. The game itself is very slow, very relaxed, but also involves a very interesting and quite a emotional story. And it's completely free. And it did come out this month, and I've seen it, and it seems really meaningful and great. So I would recommend playing it. All these games, all these games for you to play. And uh, that is the end of the releases for this month that we think that you should check out. We're now going to move on. We have just one thing that you should look out for. Um, I'm sure thing. there are plenty of other things, but this one kind of... We only have one. one so. out today, um, <laughs> which is... And the reason why is because Sam Hughes is actually voicing some of the characters in this game. Um, <laughs> what? So... Um, that's the reason I found out about it. Um, but basically, Salix Games announced and released their new game, uh, Dulac and Faye Dance of Death, which is a an adventure game, a mystery adventure game, based around the streets of Victorian London, where I can't, the main one of the main points I don't really want to spoil because it's a it's a nice little reveal in the trailer. Um, so basically I'm just going to say you should look at the teaser trailer and make some, keep an eye on it, I think. Okay. Keep an eye on it. It looks really nice. It looks really, like, high quality in a type of game. Does that make sense? That probably makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Cool. That's all we have to look out for. If you want to submit more news to this podcast so that we have more to talk about, then maybe you should. Cool. We're moving on to charity hype. I don't want to read the first one, so someone else read the first one. Ken, do you want to do it? Uh, I can. Uh, Games Done Quick, uh, they did a uh, a show, uh, I guess, basically, for the um, Hurricane Harvey relief, and they managed to raise uh, almost a quarter of a million dollars, $220,000. Wow. Um, they just basically, when the hurricane was all happening, they just set this up. With very little notice, basically, just got everyone in to do live streaming um, of speedruns. And yeah, uh, just managed to raise that much money in a fairly short amount of time. Um, I'm always fairly amazed at uh, the events they do. Uh, it gets so many people in. Uh, I mean, the speedruns are amazing, and they raise so much money for charity. It's, I mean, mm. I guess. Uh, Gaming is lucky to have groups like this that can organise that sort of thing. Yeah, it really is. And it's great that they're using their platform to make such a difference. Um, along yeah, I think that... Was one, thing, one thing I was saying... Sorry. Was one thing I was saying last week was that, you know, it's incredible to see such a interesting and tight-knit community behind this that actually attracts tens of thousands, sometimes the hundreds of thousands of people to watch. Um, something I've been very new to and seeing them do this charity work not just over summer but as well impromptuly for hurricane harvey is incredible mm. and uh, along the same vein um lauren schmidt i think that's how you say her name lauren schmidt put together a hurricane relief bundle over on itch with loads of awesome developers donating their games to the bundle 
and it made um, $10,581.48, which then got divided into a couple of different charities to help out with the cause. And uh, Itch, Itch is doing loads of these loads. People on Itch are doing um, quite a few of these bundles, and Itch is great about promoting and supporting them, and these bundles are really helping and making a difference. So that's really awesome to see. Um, yeah, just... I mean, it's great in general just to see so many people come together when this stuff happens mm. to, to help out the charities. And uh, like I was saying, the game's done quick. The fact that they can arrange it on s such short notice and still get such a huge participation, just amazing. So along that vein, um, nope, along a different vein, um, another charity that happened this month was Gamer Bake. Gamer Bake is a gaming-themed baking competition where people make baked goods bring it to a location and then it gets sold all for special effect this month was special effects one special day one special day is when special effect asks loads of different people everywhere to celebrate the day and raise money for special effect um there was loads of twitch streams there was people who like donated all of their game sales to special effect during the day and gamer bake did something a little different they held their own official gamer bake bake off bake off they held their own official gamer bake baking day but they also had offices and different companies um and places have a bake sale as well in the gamer bake theme so um there was like five i believe different places the sony london studio did a gamer bake um there was a big gamer bake which i went to um nstf the national film and art school did a uh, gamer bake so there was just loads of gamer bakes and all of the money was brought together and then whatever total they have is going to be matched by ding it tv so that they can donate double their goal was 500 pounds the count after two was a little over 200 pounds they haven't uh 237 pounds they haven't been able to total up everything quite yet, but it's looking like they probably hit their goal, and that's really nice. And I got to be a judge, and I had a great time. And I think that if you live in London or in Brighton or in wherever Gamer Bakes are, you need to come to Gamer Bake. It is the best, and all of the money goes to charity, which makes it even better to eat cakes. Yeah, I love Gamer Bakes. So, so Jupiter... Oh, no, it's like sorry. Gone. I was going to say, Jupiter... Um... Just for reference, for the next time I get involved in Gamer Bake and you're the judge at some event that I may be at, what is your favorite kind of cake? Good question. So I don't really have a favorite type of cake, um, but I really, really like cakes that are moist, not overcooked, and that are not regular chocolate cakes because everyone does regular chocolate cakes and be more creative. Um, I also... I like, I like, out of this game or bake, my favorite cake had blueberries in it, and that was really, my favorite tasting cake, I should say, it didn't win overall, but it was my favorite tasting cake, had blueberries and raspberries in it, and I think the unexpected blueberry raspberry-ness was really good. Also, simple syrup your cakes. If you're gonna bring a cake to me, and you fucking overcooked it and it's shit, simple syrup it before you bring it. If you don't know what simple syrup is, Google it. Simple syrup it before you bring it. Your cake will be ten times better, it'll be so much better. That's how like real bakers do it, and real bakeries do it. <laughs> real baker. <laughs> See, I, I agree with you there. Cool. Chocolate cake or chocolate sponge, at least, is my least favorite sponge. Oh. Well, the thing is, there'll be five other chocolate sponge cakes at the event, so yeah. just do something I mean, different. It, chocolate sponge is good, but other ones are better. I don't like. So I like Victoria's sponge. I just don't like jam and cake. Oh, I love jam and cake. Fair. We're we're completely incompatible. Sorry. We're. The marriage is off. No, wait. No, we can share cakes better now. You can have half the cakes. You can have all the oh, wait, jam yeah. cakes, and I have all the jam cakes. Yes! Wedding's it's on. Perfect, the marriage is on. Okay, so we have a couple more talking points. I don't know why we have two potential talking... Oh, things to look out for. Okay, so that's the end of our charity hype. Um, we're going to move on to... We're just going to gloat about our lives for yeah, a few we're, minutes. we're people. Um, we do things. Cool, cool. What people, we do things. We've done a lot of things. It's time for you to learn a little bit about us. Hi, my name is Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm just letting you know. I don't know how to. This is awkward. This feels awkward, guys. Um, Own it. So, by the way, if you aren't following me on Twitter for whatever reason, or if you haven't seen my tweets, I've been nominated for a golden joystick. 
I don't know how this has happened. I don't know what's going on. But Golden Joysticks is a big award ceremony that happens in London where loads of different categories get voted on by the people. That's you. And then they win awards. And there's a couple of people nominated for each category. Um, there's loads of different categories, like the best storytelling um, in games, best visual design in games, best audio, best gaming performance, best indie game. There's loads of different categories that you can vote for. One of the categories is best streamer slash broadcaster. And I'm there up against people like Hannah from the Yorgs cast, Jacksepticeye, Markiplier, Maximilian Dodd, don't know who that is, Polygon, Waypoint, What's Good Games, so I don't, I'm not really, I don't really think I'm going to win or anything, but I'm really, really honored to be nominated and on this list. That's amazing. I mean, you're the only so person it, I've heard of in the nominations. You've not heard of Jacksepticeye or Markiplier? No. Who are those? Who are those? Cool, cool. So I just... Not millions of subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you want to vote for me and you want to vote for some other game categories... Um, please do. I don't know when voting closes. Really, I have very little information on this event as a whole. Um, but, I don't know, just come on, maybe vote for me, maybe if you want, vote for me, vote for me, vote for me. Um, but yeah, vote for loads of indie games as well. That's cool. You do have to click all the way to the end and put in your email and click submit. They won't spam you. You'll get a free ebook. If you don't hit submit, it doesn't count. You should get a confirmation email. Please go to the end and hit submit. Please don't forget and not hit submit. Cool, cool. I mean, j- just in case you are uh, thinking Jupiter might be exaggerating in not knowing how this happened, we found out during EGX and there was literally half an hour of trying to figure out if this was really a- an actual real nomination that really happened. Yeah. You found out at EGX? Yeah, I did. No wonder you were so excited when you saw me. Yeah, I'd found out like just a couple of hours before. Jesus. Yeah, cool. So in other news, in more relating to me news, um, I've started a newsletter that you can sign up to. Basically, I'll email you a newsletter every week about indie meetups and gaming events that happen in the UK. If you're interested in indie gaming events and meetups that happen in the UK, this is going to be your resource so that you can come and then maybe see me and then maybe get a sticker. If you go, hello, Jupiter, I'm a fan of your work. Can I have a sticker? That's how things work at events. I'd love to see you there. If you're interested in that newsletter, sign up. Um, I'm not going to spam you because I don't have time to spam you, frankly. Um, You'll just get a newsletter every month. That's it. No catches. And that's all I've really been up to. I'm going to give a little shout out to Big Boss Battle. Uh, Big Boss Battle is a website that talks about game reviewing stuff. Uh, They review games and I got to hang out with Dan, one of the editors from the site. And they're doing some great stuff over there. They were really fast in their coverage from EGX. And they cover a great variety of games and post up articles daily. Um, A lot of the games that they're covering from EGX are games that I talked about here. There's uh, Mechanic Panic. There's Ava Airborne. There's, um, of course, Exposure, that article I wrote. They just, it's great. They're right on top of things. It's amazing. Um, yeah. Uh, I also am going to shout out Indie Game Launchpad because they're doing great stuff. If you want to advertise your game and have your game advertised for free, uh, you should put it on Indie Game Launchpad. You can listen to this podcast on Indie Game Launchpad as well. I feel like we should start mentioning that at the end of stuff because I said we would and then I forgot, but that's okay. Yeah, they, they like us. We should definitely mention that they like us. They like us, and the guy who runs the site is just, he likes promoting indie games. So if you have an indie game, stick it up there and he'll promote it for you. It's great. That's all I've really been up to this week. Um, Kemp, I heard you wrote an article. I did. It happens so rarely. Um, yeah, I uh, wrote up an article on games that have programming as a mechanic. Uh, so games that actually require you to write code as the game itself, or that have an optional mechanic where you can write code... Uh, to have better outcomes and various things in between and yeah i i talked to uh, a, a few uh, uh, well basically i talked to a couple of people that i know online that like these sorts of games and i talked to uh zach from zachtronics uh, who did tis 100 and shenzhen io and i'm i quite like my article so please go and read it go on. The, 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 I'm sure the link will be in the, the description below to the side above or in an appropriate other place, depending on where you see this. Yes, it will be. Joseph, tell us about you. Is there anything you've done that you're proud of particularly this month? Um, 
I made a good some good fajitas. <laughs> That's good. Um, <laughs> this this month, um, thing. All I want to say is that things are in the works. Uh, basically, I'm just settling down into a new way of life, and there will be hopefully next month there'll be some things I can talk about. But at the moment, I'm keeping them keeping them under close to my hat close to my heart for now and then soon i will release them for the world to see and enjoy so kemp is full of sorry so joseph is full of mysteries of secrets awesome <laughs> um but basically everything things have started but they're not started enough yet that i feel comfortable giving them out okay that's fine so things to look out for joseph cool cool <laughs> So, uh, thank you very much for watching this month's episode, or listening to this month's episode of What's Cindy News. If you're listening to this on iTunes or SoundCloud, please consider rating this. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, leave a comment. Talk to us about it. And if you want to get involved with the discussion, feel free to join our Discord and poke us occasionally. And tell us about the games that you've released for the month or what you've seen going on. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Jupiter underscore Hadley. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Kemp Plays. You can find me on Twitter at um, Hesketh Joseph. Uh, you can check out my site, jmhesketh.com. Those are the two places that you'll find most things about me. Uh, links are in the description. Feel free to subscribe on all platforms that that is relevant. Bye! See ya!